our focus is really Web3. So we invest in Web3 infrastructure. We invest in the building blocks that create the next generation of the internet. So, you know, people want to flex socially on the internet probably as much as they want to flex uh, in, in real life. Where the upside is so huge because mass adoption will probably be in, I don't know, five years. Let's, we have about 200 million Ethereum wallets now around the world. If you extrapolate that uh, to, to these 1 billion rules, we would say maybe in the next five to, to six years, we've got some sort of mass adoption in Web3. Hello, wonderful people. We're in Dubai this week, meeting the most amazing entrepreneurs in the blockchain and crypto space. And today I have my dear friend with me, Hubertus. Hi, Hubertus. Thank you so much for joining the interview. Hubertus is a partner with a local crypto-focused fund called GAF Capital. And he will tell us all about the investment opportunities that are, they're looking into. Thanks for having me, Irina. Hello. Um, tell me about GAF Capital. You're quite a new kid on the block and already made so many investments over the last year. Tell me uh, about GAF Capital, who are your partners and why now? Yeah, GAF Capital actually is the first uh, UAE-based and homegrown uh, venture capital firm. We're not a fund. We are actually four family office um, uh, investment vehicles that work together. And um, it's mainly local families, um, you know, well-known uh, entrepreneurs with great networks in the region. And I joined them last year just to add, uh, you know, more international flavor uh, to the team. And our focus is really Web3. So we invest in Web3 infrastructure. We invest in the building blocks that create the next generation of the Internet, going from uh, games to NFTs to DeFi infrastructure mainly, but also to exchanges we recently invested in uh, the first African um, crypto exchange, CoinMara, or uh, base layer protocols like uh, Layer Zero. So it's completely um, across the board. And the goal is really to uh, provide to the entrepreneurs we invest in some added value uh, and some on-ramp into the UAE or, let's say, Middle Eastern ecosystem. And, and why is it important? Why do projects need on-ramp to the UAE or Middle Eastern ecosystem? The Middle East uh, is a, a very important market in terms of demographics. It's a very young clientele. Um, the average age is way lower than in many other parts of the world. And the adoption of uh, mobile technologies and crypto in particular is higher than in other parts and faster in particular. So it's important to uh, provide uh, you know, entrepreneurs access to these regions. But it's not only that, it's also the setting up of companies. I mean, uh, we are very well connected to uh, the infrastructures of free zones, for instance, um, and we can provide the companies this uh, assistance and this help as well. And on top of that, obviously, we have, um, we have uh, connections, not only in the Middle East, but also beyond in terms of marketing, contact to exchanges, um, market making even. We provide liquidity for that as well, if needed. So it's a, it's a wide range of support. Uh, we become really, uh, if you want, the UAE partners um, of our portfolio companies, which they appreciate. And I also think it's quite important to mention for everybody who's watching us, Middle East, if you include Turkey, is over 600 million people. It's a very young generation. Everybody's very well connected. Everybody has a mobile device. And the banking rates are less than 15% if you exclude Israel. So we have, you know, I think it's a perfect storm for crypto, crypto adoption, for DeFi projects adoption, young population, very well connected, everybody has a smart device and less than 15% of the population are banked. So do you think uh, that's what attracts projects to come here to, to, to get this user base, to get to our community? It could be, but I, I think, you know, the projects we invest in mainly, they are um, international. So they are not focused only on the Middle East. Um, I think that's an element, but uh, on the flip side, you need to also consider the regulatory part. I mean. Um, it's true what you say that we have this huge opportunity, this gap between, uh, you know, unbanked on the un on one hand and the huge uh, adoption potential on the other. But at the same time, there's the regulator who wants to protect retail and we need to see how this plays out. So that's not the main thesis, but it's obviously a very important ingredient. Are there any particular sectors of the quite large now crypto ecosystem that Gas Capital are looking at? There's a lot of excitement about Gamify, for example, at the moment, play to earn. Do you see that as a valuable segment to invest in or do you think it's just a hype and it will all go away just like so many hypes have, have you know, came and gone? 
Well, I mean, if you think about it, what we're seeing here in Web3 is the evolution of the internet, really, right? So we have actually the, the next layer of the internet where creators, builders, and users uh, basically own all part of the infrastructure. And Play to Earn is a great example for that. I remember when I, one of my first startups was in the classically free to play game space in the year 2000, and everybody was screaming in the old industry, oh, what is this free to play? How can this be a viable business model? Now it became mainstream, and now the same thing happens with play to earn. So a lot of the incumbents, the free to play companies, they are pretty annoyed about that because they don't want to give away some of their, uh, some of their pie, obviously part of the pie which they own currently. So I think it has a lot of uh, it has a lot, a lot of legs because it involves the users, um, uh, same as the creators and the infrastructure providers. Um, but on the other hand, we will see, you know, if these are pure games uh, focused on, you know, creating token economics and creating hype around the coin or if these are viable games that can also exist outside of the classical crypto uh, sphere, if you want, as an individual game. Because most of the games that we see now in blockchain, the UX is still not great. Are there games out there that you want to give a, a shout out to, that you like, that you invested, that has a great UI, UX, and also a great game to play? Because it's all good to have a game where people can earn, but if it's a a boring or not interesting game, I mean, I don't think it will have, you know, a lot of legs to stand on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we invested in a number of uh, NFT based, um, you know, play to earn games in our portfolio. But one uh, project that I particularly like because of its long term vision is uh, CTA across the ages. Uh, the reason why I invested in this company was particularly because of the team. Uh, Sammy has assembled a group of um, fantastic artists around it. I think it's a rough, roughly 70 people in the artist space, you know, who worked for brands like Harry Potter, Marvel, League of Legends, Game of Thrones, etc. So really people who know this industry deep and inside out are part of the core team. And the vision of Cross the Ages is to create a really, uh, basically seven novels written around seven books, basically, that are going to be gamified. And it's a long-term project. It's not just a quick coin flip. It's something that is supposed to become you know, um, the, you know, future uh, kind of um, metaverse type of game and it's evolving and it, it, it bridges the gap between um, a crypto, between collectors and between uh, the gaming industry. So it's, it's beautiful. It has some elements of DeFi, but also some elements of collectibles and NFTs. So um, it's, it's exciting to see that. But the main reason why I invested them is really the team and the long term vision. You mentioned metaverse, and I think it's quite a, a logical way to take a gamified project too, right? So you have a large community of players, gamers, they come together, you can create leagues where people actually, you know, partner up with other players, play against each other, and then you have to take it somewhere, right? You can't just say, okay, thank you very much, we've all played. And, and a lot of games are taking it to the metaverse level, and there's something, uh, something like three billion worth of land sales in the metaverse happened recently. What do you think about this trend? Like, how do you think it's absolutely crazy and insane, or do you think it's logical and we all should get some metaverse land? <laughs> I think people spend more and more time on screen, right? So if you think about it, uh, previously there was the competition, you know, which gaming application competes against another one. Today it's really about competing for eyeballs and competing for screen time. So um, it's, it's, no, it's no wonder that, uh, you know, the metaverse has gained adoption because, uh, you know, people want to flex socially on the Internet probably as much as they want to flex uh, in, in real life. And um, the metaverse is an evolution of that. Um, so honestly, I think um, it's in principle a good thing. If you think about it, we don't know what the metaverse will be uh, in, in, in 10 years. It's the same if in the 1990s somebody would have asked me how is gonna, the Internet going to look in, in 10 years. Nobody knows. But I think some of the building blocks that are currently being created um, will survive. Others will, will probably die out. This is very normal. And um, I think that the key will be that some of these metaverses, there will be some sort of interoperability between the metaverses has to exist because otherwise it will become tricky, uh, you know, to, to, to miss out and to, to focus on one particular game. So for instance, some digital avatar standard, for instance, right, where you can take your character, create it, take it and, you know, move it around. Uh, in, in, in various forms in the metaverses. I think this is something which probably we want to see in the, in the near, in the, not probably the near future, but in the more distant future. But um, um, for, for now, it's very siloed. And on top of it, there's the conversation between the Facebook meta metaverse, which they want to create, right? Which is more 
around centralized uh, with a goal of creating uh, you know data and revenues for them for a, for a tech company versus the decentralized metaverse where people own part of the infrastructure so and how you think that will work out for facebook um, because uh, just a couple of days ago, they announced that they're shutting down DM or Libra, what it was called before. So that did not work. The cryptocurrency did not work for them because they're centralized. There's a centralized point of attack by the regulators. How will the metaverse, do you think the metaverse will work for them? Because people chose Bitcoin, a decentralized coin, over some cent centralized Facebook uh, uh, Coin. Yeah, I think by jumping into cryptocurrency, um, Facebook made a very bold move. And honestly, I don't think it was a very well thought through project because when you're touching currency, you're automatically touching regulation. This is not the case in the metaverse, which is less regulated environments. I think they have more chances to succeed. But um, obviously, they are now um, fighting against the mega trend, which is decentralization and which is, uh, you know, as we said before, the community and the owners and um, the creators sharing the infrastructure. This is not the business model of Facebook. Facebook wants to, I think they will create the metaverse to capture more um, advertising revenues uh, or more revenues uh, to a centralized uh, entity called Facebook. And that's, that's probably perfect, a good on-ramp for traditional industries who feel less comfortable with the um, decentralized Web3 um, kind of acumen, but who want to be more on a, in a corporate uh, institutional uh, route and enter more uh, kind of a different route to this metaverse. Um, but eventually it's good because it's the more, the more people are in this industry and the more people are in the metaverse, even on Facebook, potentially they might migrate over to, to some decentralized structure. So I think everybody who is now involved with getting involved um, will help us to grow the pie, which eventually helps the whole industry and the whole ecosystem. Some metaverses are becoming um, really expensive um, if some celebrity buys some land, right? So, uh, so what do we do? Do we start like in a cheaper metaverse and work our way up to a more expensive metaverse? Or how is, do you think it's going to work? I don't know. I mean, this is exactly uh, the crystal ball. Nobody really knows. I think the only thing I know and which is um, what we invest in is the building blocks for this infrastructure. Um, and uh, for instance, one of our co portfolio companies, Space, they create a Shopify for the metaverse. So the on-ramp for offline retail into the metaverse to build their uh, experiences, the digital experiences where, where people can then buy their goods in, in, in terms of arts, fashion, uh, music, etc. So this is, I think these building blocks, they have to be, and they have to be uh, metaverse agnostic, by the way. So this is the interesting part, which is being uh, built. If eventually, you know, there will be um, uh, some FOMO and people will go for these lands, grab it and the prices will increase, um, we don't know. Um, we're also looking at now, you know, investing in a company that creates a digital real estate agency for the metaverse. I mean, it doesn't exist yet either. So, <laughs> so there is a lot of interesting stuff um, coming up. And I am such a boomer. I'm actually buying real land and I'm buying real properties and, and living in a real forest. Exactly. So I'm exactly. such a boomer. I don't, I don't know. Do you think I should get some metaverse land? Um, I think you should get it just for uh, to getting involved to understand how it works. Um, this is how I would get involved, not particularly to speculate on it, but just to understand and learn. Fair enough. Let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about practical things. So for all of the startups that are watching us right now, if they have an amazing project, amazing idea, how can they pitch themselves to Gas Capital? That's one. And secondly, what do you, as a, as a very experienced investor, because you've been uh, investing for, for quite a few years, not just in crypto, but in traditional markets as well, um, in, in tech traditional markets. So what does a startup need to have in order to be investable? And how does a startup get attention over um, very exper experienced uh, venture capitalists, not only for money, but for attention, mentorship and advice? Because money right now is very cheap. Um, so many projects can raise money. It's just that mentorship advice that's hard to grab that attention. Yeah, I think to analyze these questions, we need to make a little bit of a step back. So where are we now in terms of the, the evolution of this of these Web3 industry? I think we are still far away from mass adoption, right? So we, I mean, if you look at uh, tech, um, internet, mobile, mass adoption, mass market adoption took place when you had at least 1 billion users. We are far away from that in, 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 in crypto and Web3. And I think um, particularly Web3, we are far away from that. So um, that obviously means as an investor, you are uh, looking 
for huge asymmetric trades now. So you're investing in infrastructures where the upside is so huge because mass adoption will probably be in, I don't know, five years. Let's, we have about 200 million Ethereum wallets now around the world. If you extrapolate that uh, to, to this 1 billion rule, so we would say maybe in the next five to, to six years, we've got some sort of mass adoption in Web3. So we are really ahead of the curve, everybody who invests now and who jumps into this industry now. So we need to be aware of the huge risks involved. As an entrepreneur on the other side, I think it's, it's exactly the same as in traditional uh, you know, Web2 technology. I mean, first of all, you need to come up with a solution that um, aims to solve a problem, right? So if you just create a solution um, looking for a problem, it's probably going to be hard. Uh, so there has to be some sort of uh, angle to it, like Space, for instance, the company I, I, I mentioned before, they're creating the Shopify for the metaverse, a very practical solution. We all don't know how the metaverse is going to be, play out, be, uh, going to play out. But I think it's, it's, it's uh, something that is, is a, it's an in infrastructure layer that will help to, 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 to basically proliferate the metaverse and create these ecosystems. Um, another element, obviously, we look at that's very important is the experience of the team. We mentioned across the ages. I mean, they have 160 team members. It's, it's huge. It's one of the largest, or even the largest uh, team and most professional experience team in the whole uh, crypto landscape in gaming. Uh, that's what we look at. That's, that's very important because this is, you know, how you build, uh, you know, how you create traction and how you build quality. Uh, the next, the next level, obviously, is the, the the product itself. I mean, is the product market fit? It's probably too early because the market is still evolving, but the technology that is being used needs to be uh, solidly founded. So it's it's not substantially different uh, than the criteria they look at in traditional venture uh, or startups. Uh, it's just um, the risk is higher, and you you need to accept more. Uh, uncertainties and, um, and, and also from an investor's point of view, have a large enough portfolio to um, uh, account for the fact that some of these companies eventually um, will fail and it's, it's so early in the industry. So how can um, entrepreneurs get hold of GAF Capital if they want to pitch their project to you? Well, we mainly work uh, with referrals. So we get a lot of referrals from uh, investors that we work with together. So we co-invested with uh, the largest uh, VC funds in the space from Multicoin to Pantera to uh, Polygon, etc. So uh, we get a lot of referrals from them. Um, but if somebody wants to reach out, um, uh, www.gavcapitalae, we have a website outlining exactly our thesis, what we're looking for, uh, outlining how we can support the startups beyond capital because that's very important so as we said before we want to become the partners so to speak of these startups in the region to help them to get a foothold to have some sort of flag in the territory of, of, uh, of the uae particularly and um, they can reach out to us we have a team which is now growing um, and um, we are happy to 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 look at it really great very useful information thank you so much for coming over and thank you for dedicating your time to tell us about gaff capital and of course cross the ages the project you're mostly excited about and i am mostly excited about thank you so much and we'll see you at the aibc from the 20th of march to the 23rd i look forward to meeting gaff capital in in, in full force and all of your portfolio companies thank you Rina.